The Harlan Community Library is pleased to introduce Darcy Molesby with her program, Iowa's Lost History from the Titanic. This program has been funded by Humanities Iowa, a private nonprofit, and the State Historical Society, INC. A cultural resource for Iowans since 1971, Humanities Iowa brings humanities programs into the heart of Iowa communities. The humanities are fields of study that help us discover and remember who we are and how we came to be as individuals and as part of the world. <coughs> humanities Iowa offers funding for the Speakers Bureau event and for grants in support of public programs to nonprofit organizations in the state of Iowa. If you have not already, if you have not already, please sign the sign in form following the event on the same form you can opt in to receive monthly emails about Humanities Iowa events all over the state as well as its annual print magazine. I would encourage you to sign up for both communications. They are great ways to stay informed about Humanities events like this one all across Iowa. Humanity Iowa assures me that they respect your privacy and will not sell or share any uh, contact information you may choose to provide. For more information or to make donations, their website is right here. And please take it away, Darcy Malsby. Basically, their spiel is a, a long way of saying it's a great program to make it affordable for libraries to bring speakers in. So, yay, Humanities <laughs> Iowa. <laughs> and you've got a very astute librarian here. She noticed my necklace right away. So does this seem to have anything with what, to do with what we're talking about tonight? That looks like the um, heart, heart, heart of the, the one that went down. Yes, the one yes. that went down in the ocean. So totally fictional, but it's still fun. Yeah. And we'll talk about the movie a little bit as well as, as the facts tonight. So I'm from Lake City. I'm about an hour and a half away. I'm an ag journalist by trade. So most of the time I'm writing about crops and livestock and manure and stuff like that. <laughs> but, I know, but you know, we'll talk about a farmer tonight. Everything has a tie to agriculture, even the Titanic. So history is my hobby and I, I've written a number of books about Iowa history. So I think you will really enjoy the program tonight because you're obviously all interested in the Titanic. And a lot of people are very surprised to learn that there were 20 some people with ties to Iowa and Titanic. Yeah. We'll only talk about a few of them tonight. Uh, my, when my book comes out, hopefully this year, uh, we, you'll get the whole spiel. Yeah. But for now, you'll get a little preview. <laughs> Just a teaser. Just a teaser. And I tell people I'm not a teacher, and this is not school, so if you have questions as we go along, or comments, raise your hand, shout them out. We'll just deal with them as we go, if that's all right with you. So, for me, this interest in Titanic goes back a long ways, actually longer than 2017, but the idea for the book kind of took root at this time, because I was at a tea party, of all things, over in Iowa City at the Johnson County Historical Society, and it was one of those events where you get to assume a, an identity of someone who really was on Titanic. I had a boarding pass. Has anybody ever done anything like that? Yeah, yeah, and then you find out at the end whether your person lived or died. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> right? And we'll talk about my boarding pass as Francis Marie Lefebvre, but we'll, we'll get there. So that was a fun event, and it was an Iowa type, but like I said, we'll get there. So how many of you remember when Dr. Robert Ballard found Titanic in 1985? 73 years after she sank. Yeah. I was about 12 at the time, and I was captivated by this. I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. And the reason it took so long to find Titanic all those years is she's two and a half miles down at the bottom of the North Atlantic. You don't just jump down on a little submersible and, well, look what happened to the Titan this past summer. It's still potentially deadly to make this journey. It, she was hard to find. And part of what was going on here is that Dr. Ballard, even though he was a Navy man, he was not down there just to find Titanic. He was actually on a mission from the U.S. Navy. They were trying to find two cold aero nuclear submarines, the Scorpion and the Thresher, that had disappeared under mysterious circumstances in the 1960s. The Navy wanted to know where these were exactly and whether the engines were giving off any nuclear waste. 
And so a lot of this, they couldn't tell us all this at the time. You can see all the things that were redacted in this classified letter. So it's only in the last five or six years that some of this was actually released. But essentially what happened is Dr. Ballard had a certain length on this contract. They gave him a certain length of time to find these two nuclear subs. He also knew Titanic was roughly in the same area as these two subs. And the Navy said, if you find these subs and you have time left, have at it. Go find okay. Titanic. And what he learned from finding those two subs taught him how to find Titanic. He did manage to find her in just a few days in those 12 days that he had left after finding the subs. In a nutshell, what's going on down at that depth of the ocean is there are lots of currents. It's not a static, calm place. There's all kinds of ocean currents weaving around down there. And when any vessel sinks and it breaks apart, stuff falls out, and then those ocean currents push it in certain patterns. And he essentially learned how to read what the ocean currents were doing in that part of the North Atlantic. So that's how he was able to find Titanic. Actually, there's even a tie to Iowa with one of these nuclear subs. I believe it was the Scorpion. There was a young man from Carroll, Iowa, that was on that and perished in that implosion. Were they able to find the subs? Yep, they found them, and they were not leaking nuclear waste. So they did find both of them. So let's roll them. They're still down there. They're still down there, as is Titanic. Yep. Yep. Yep, good questions. So let's roll the clock back to 1912. I think it's really easy for all of us. With history, it's so tempting to look at all this through modern eyes, through our 2024 eyes. The world was a lot different in 1912. So one thing that was new, I was just eating some of these this afternoon, a fabulous new invention called Oreo cookies in 1912, as well as lifesavers, which is kind of bizarre when we're talking about Titanic. <laughs> Cars were still a relatively new invention. It was October of 1908 when Henry Ford basically made cars available to the common man with the advent of the Model T, so not everybody is driving cars yet, but they're popular. Cost two cents to mail a letter. Uh, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> Uh, women could not vote in presidential elections. Women's suffrage was still about eight years away, although women could vote in some municipal elections. So, And hopefully we will not break this record, but Wash to Iowa up by Cherokee hit the, the record, and it's, that record still stands as far as I know. For the coldest spot in Iowa, January 1912, minus 47. Was that with that wind or no? <laughs> Probably not even with wind chills. Yeah. 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 I don't think they even mentioned No, it was just dang cold. You know, that's what you call cold. That's cold. Yeah, exactly. So at this time, uh, Titanic, she is a modern marvel because she's really not that far removed from the days of the sailing ships. So we in, into the 1890s, I mean, we're, we're still seeing ships carrying those sails as auxiliary gear. We have these coal-fired engines, but we still have some of the old-fashioned backup. And you, if you ever wondered how long it took your immigrant ancestors, because I'm assuming most of us come from immigrants that came from across the sea to America, it could take anywhere from maybe two or three weeks if you were super lucky, to four to six weeks to make that passage. And if there was a storm at sea that messed everything up, it could take the maximum time, six weeks or more. And the worst part is you couldn't tell anybody. You couldn't tell anybody back home, and you couldn't tell anybody where you were going when to expect you, because it was just a, a free-for-all out here, and we didn't have the communication. And we didn't have ships that could do anything more than kind of be at the mercy of the wind. So when we start in the 1800s, starting to move along with some steam power, coal-fired engines, by the time we get up to 1912, Titanic had the latest and greatest of everything, including powerful engines and the ability, like a lot of other transatlantic ships at this time, to make that crossing consistently in a week. So you could get across the North Atlantic in a week, then they would pick up passengers in the destination, haul a backload back to the other part of the world. 
And it was incredibly profitable for these shipping lines. Titanic was, their parent company was the White Star Line. There were others in other countries that, I mean, there was a the very competitive industry. And what people don't always realize is they think the very wealthy on these transatlantic liners were the ones that really paid the freight and made this profitable. No way, it was the third class passengers because there were so many more of them. And we've got all these people immigrating at this time. So third class is where these shipping lines made their money, but they're always looking to get an edge on each other. It's competitive. You want people to book tickets on your line and not the others. So this is part of why Titanic was made to be not only the latest and greatest, but like a floating palace. She was the last word in luxury. There was nothing like her on the seas. Ma'am. Yes. I can't remember. Was that their first time taking that out? It was. It was okay. the maiden voyage. Now she had a, a sister ship named Olympic that had set sail about a few years before Titanic. That ship had made multiple crossings and life was good, but, but yes, this was Titanic's very first journey, and its only journey, that it never actually <laughs> completed. So, good question. Now the other thing Titanic had that was really quite novel and remarkable for 1912 is Marconi Wireless. Sometimes kids ask me, what is that? It's basically radio, right? It's the forerunner of what we know as radio. So we finally have a way to have ship-to-shore and ship-to-ship -ship communication. So not only do you have a ship with all the latest technological innovations, a floating palace, it's got everything you could ever want, it's practically unsinkable, that's what Shipbuilder Magazine called it. We got nothing to worry about, right? So, except an iceberg, right? <laughs> So she set sail from Southampton, England, April 10th, 1912. She heads across the English Channel. She goes to Cherbourg, France, picks up more passengers, including a lot of the first class passengers, goes back across the Channel, heads back to the British Isles, goes to Ireland to a place called Queenstown, now known as Cove, Ireland, gets the last of the passengers, actually some people who had gotten on at the previous two stops but were not going to America, they get off the ship, were loaded with all our passengers that we're going to ta take, which is roughly 2,200. We set sail uh, across the North Atlantic, bound for New York. Plenty of life jackets, over 3,500. Now, this ship could hold about 3,500 people, so she was below capacity on this maiden voyage. Plenty of life jackets, 20 lifeboats with a capacity of 1,178. Do you see a problem? Yeah. <laughs> but believe it or not, she was actually way ahead of the game in terms of what the British Shipping Board required in terms of safety. That 1178 was actually more than she was required to have. Because, you know, I told you, she's the latest and greatest in the with shipping technology. Well, basically, there hadn't been a major accident. For years and so the shipping board of trade their their standards are still back in the 1890s when ships were a lot smaller they weren't these huge floating hotels but why worry about it there hadn't been a major accident for years and Titanic is practically unsinkable she was the largest man-made moving object on the planet in 1912 she was about four city blocks long. Sometimes when I give this program wow. in really little towns, I say she's actually longer than your whole Main Street. Not <laughs> true. <laughs> uh, about the width of a four-lane highway. So think the interstate, think Highway 20 or any of these big four lanes. Uh, about the height of an 11-story building. And that will come into play when you wonder, why didn't people get into those lifeboats when they should have? Yeah. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> So to ride on Titanic, you had prices all over the board. You know, this is the era, this is a British ship. This is still very much a class society. So you've got first class, well, let's talk about third class first. These are generally your uh, lower income people, lots of immigrants, but sometimes it's just frugal people that could have paid more, but they just wanted to save their money, so they had more when they got where they were going. So it's still not chump change, 300 to 800 bucks a ticket. Might have been your whole life savings, depending on your circumstances. Second class is more of your business class travelers, about 1,200 a ticket. 
first class, it's all over the board. You could be a cheapo at 3000 or you could have the biggest parlor suite for over 83000 <laughs> I mean, the kind of wealth we're talking about is just incredible. We will never see a time when you have that stratification traveling on the same vessel. Because if you're that wealthy today, you have your own yacht, you have your own private jet. You're not riding with folks like us. But they had no choice in 1912. Airplanes were just starting to become a thing. And if you wanted to get across the ocean, you rode on a ship. <laughs> so why not make it nice? And so that the movie, the Titanic movie, sometimes people will ask me, well, would Jack and Rose have actually met? No way. <laughs> That's all Hollywood. Oh, come on. I know it. I know it. We're going to keep that like they really I know. Wouldn't that be great? Because <laughs> the first class was far, far away in the layout of the ship from the third class. They, you just, they didn't mix. Now what's funny about that is that there was a guy named Jack Dawson that was on Titanic. He was a coal stoker. He was one of the guys that shoveled coal into the engines. He's buried up in Halifax, where Canada, where some of these bodies that were recovered ended up being buried. And all these gals love putting flowers and all kinds of trinkets and stuff on his grave because I think they think it's the real, it's like the movie Jack Dawson. No, it's not Leonardo DiCaprio. I know. So, so that Jack Dawson, the coal stoker, became way more famous in death than he ever was in Now, there were big name celebrities on board, very rich people. We had professional athletes in first class, a, a tennis player named Carl Baer. He was trying to track down his girlfriend over in Europe. Her folks, or her parents didn't like him for whatever reason, and, and you know, you can't stop love. So he goes across the ocean, finds her, and they get reunited. They make it bad. They survived the sinking of Titanic, both of them. Ironically, there was another pro tennis player on on board. Um, I believe his name was Williams. And years later, these two guys ended up playing a tennis match against each other. So just weird little Titanic trivia. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt. But no, no. So I guess I, going according to that movie, I always thought that that lady was the only one that survived. Oh. But. No, there were uh, about a third of the people on the ship did survive. But yeah, sometimes it's a little confusing with movies. They can... Well, come on, movie. Yeah, I know. Uh, well, actually, Titanic, the movie's pretty good, though. It's yes. pretty darn accurate yeah. for us. Did you movie. see, though, or, or maybe you did, were all those, uh, was it a complete, uh, did they have it all completely full? No. No, it had. Now, this is interesting because my best friend, her great great she had a ticket she couldn't get on because it was full and she never went and i wonder if i told my friend i wonder if they still got that ticket that probably would be worth some money but that would. was the story she couldn't get on well that's because it was full that is entirely possible yeah. and i only say that because you'll meet a family here that was traveling second class they it was a miracle that they got a ticket because when he went to the ticket office they were sold out. So I think what was happening is some of the levels of tickets were sold out. Oh, but the this ship would have probably been the lower end of it. Yeah, she, so, I see what you're saying. Yeah, sure. exactly. It's that a little confusing. So, so yes, a capacity of 3,500, roughly 2,200 people on board. So. Well, then my friend said then she wouldn't be here because, you know, Absolutely. it's a generation. Absolutely. Yeah. So I don't doubt that story for yeah. a minute. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So we had a movie star on board, a gal named Dorothy Gibson. She was traveling first class. She too survives the sinking, and she makes a movie within three weeks of this event. Uh, in those days, the, the Hollywood wasn't Hollywood. The movie industry was in New Jersey. So they make this film. She wears the same outfit in the film that she had on the night of the sinking. Now, Titanic buffs would love to get their hands on this film, but what happened is one of the warehouses where the films were stored back then had a big fire about, oh, it was either 1919 oh, or the early 20s. That film does not exist anymore. Oh, I know, bummer, huh? Mm -hmm. We had a fashion designer on board, Lady Duff Gordon. Pretty sure that one of our first class passengers you'll meet tonight probably either knew her personally or probably wore some of her designs. What's also interesting about Lady Duff, not only was she designing clothes for very wealthy people, but she survives the sinking she goes on to make what today we would call a line extension, like when Target has some of the designer clothes, 
that are manufactured for those of us that uh, can actually afford that kind of stuff at Target and <laughs> <laughs> the, the big name stores. She did that with the Sears catalog. So you could have bought some of her clothes around 1916, 1917, a cheaper version of it in the Sears catalog. If you want to read more about Lady Duff Gordon and her time on the Titanic, there's a book called The Dressmaker by Kate Al Alcott. And it more focuses on Lady Duff Gordon's helper that goes with her. Yes. But it's mostly about them on the Titanic. Oh, it's called The Dressmaker. The Dressmaker. And okay. it does talk about what you just said about her line of clothing that then she starts. Uh -huh. It's really good. Oh, good. good. I have not read that. Now I want to read that. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. So Molly Brown wasn't on the show? She was. She was. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. She. Good question. She was also traveling first class. She was a very wealthy lady from Denver. She's actually a Midwestern girl. Does anybody know where in the Midwest she was born? I'll give you a hint. It was in Missouri. Oh. <laughs> Hannibal. Hannibal, oh, the wow. same town as Mark, Mark Twain. Twain. Yeah. Oh, yep, so you can visit her birthplace there. As a kid, she was working in a, cigar, a cigar factory there, rolling cigars and such yes. things. The unsinkable Molly Brown. And we will talk a little bit about that because nobody ever called her Molly in her lifetime. She was in, Margaret. Is that a restaurant in uh, Colorado? It could be. Because yeah, because I was there then, if that's okay. the Okay, and, and you yeah. can tour her home in Denver. I've done that too, mm -hmm. so that's worth a, a visit. Mm -hmm. She was interesting. She was one of those ladies, because she had the time and the money to do such things, she was an advocate for homeless pets. She basically was one of the founders of an animal shelter in Denver and all kinds of things. So, yeah, lots of fascinating people on the ship. John Jacob Astor IV, definitely the richest man in America in 1912, one of the richest guys in the world. He's 47 at the time. He has an 18-year-old wife. <laughs> there was a divorce. He remarried a much younger woman. And in 1912, divorce was incredibly scandalous. They were from New York. And he frankly got tired of all the gossips, chitter-chattering about them, so he takes his new bride on a big around-the-world trip on a honeymoon to the Middle East and elsewhere. So she gets pregnant during this honeymoon, and they're coming back to the States in April of 1912. Sadly, he does not survive the sinking. She does, and she goes on in August of 1912 to give birth to their son. Anybody heard of the Guggenheim Museum? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So this is Ben Guggenheim, another first class passenger, is a relative to that Guggenheim family. He was traveling on Titanic with his mistress. Ooh. Yeah. Although he did say when the ship was going down, he wanted people to tell his wife that he loved her. <coughs> uh, a little late then. Huh? Yeah, a little late then. <laughs> and has anybody ever shopped at Macy's or heard of Macy's? Oh, yeah. Everybody's heard of Macy's, yeah. right? So if you've seen the movie and you see that older couple that refuses to part with each other and they go down with the ship, that is based on real people, Isadora and Ida Strauss, who were traveling first class. She said, I, you know, I've been with you my whole life. Where you go, I go. So that kind of devotion is just remarkable to me because they both perished. And she definitely could have gotten away in a lifeboat. There were 12 dogs on Titanic. Oh, Just like today, if you're wealthy, you take your dog with you. Well, of course, you don't even have to be wealthy. Lots of people take their dogs lots of places anymore. They were supposed to have a dog show on board that Monday morning, but unfortunately, Titanic sank at 2.20 a.m. April 15th, so there was no dog show. The only three dogs survived. I don't know how anybody survived with that icy water. That's it, just crazy it's to amazing. figure out. It is amazing. And I, I don't normally talk about it, but since you brought that up, look up a guy named Charles Jowin. It's a weird spelled name. It's like J-A-U-G-H-L-I-N or something like that. He was a baker on board. And he had enough presence of mind when he found out the ship was sinking. He went and drank all the whiskey and alcohol that he could <laughs> after helping people get off the ship. But then he's, and that might have kept him warm. And he was out in, warm then. Yeah, he's out in the water nonetheless. I mean, 28 degree water for an extended time, and he survives. So there's stuff like that that's fascinating to me too of how one survives in a disaster like this. Drink alcohol if you're in this situation. Well, it, it really made me mad at that movie. Um, 
-hmm. She's floating along. He could have got, got least up yeah. on there, so he didn't die. I mean, to tell you. I don't know. It's interesting when you. I know. I felt the same way the first time I saw don't it. Don't let go of his hand. Get him up on I know. They say that that. I'll tell you, when I went to a, a Titanic museum down in Branson, if anybody's ever been to that one, you can put your hand in a fountain of 28 degree water. Yes. You're probably thinking, why is she talking about 28 degree water? Because water freezes at 32 degrees, not salt. salt water. Salt water. Right. Oh, that's right. Right. So I thought, well, I'm a tough Iowa farm girl. I could put my hand under that water for probably five minutes. I was crying for mercy after about 15 seconds. Oh, really? really? It is so hard on you. And if you are immersed in this water, they, they talk, Charles Lighthaller was the second officer on the ship who survived, and he, he talks about a thousand knives. That's what it feels like, a thousand knives being driven into you. So what happens is it sends your body into shock, and so real fast you, get, you start getting incapacitated. And you, you, a lot of these folks didn't drown. What happens is they died of hypothermia. Mm -hmm. So all these things, because I felt the same way you did. Why, don't, why didn't they just yeah. do this? Because your body won't let you. Well, the thing <laughs> of it is, though, how in the heck, you know, somebody could still be alive, but they could yell out, okay, yell out, and I'm thinking. Well, that's and the she other. just barely had a whistle on I me. Mean, I'm sure nobody else, but I'm thinking. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, here's one more odd thing for you, too, <laughs> if you think <laughs> these <laughs> things don't exist. One of the older ladies in a lifeboat actually had a battery-operated cane with a light in the bottom of it. Really? So, so some of them did have these oh, weird little we things. Things. Maybe not a whistle, but a battery-operated yeah. lighted I mean, cane. You could. <laughs> But uh, when it, that's another good point. I usually don't tell all these stories, yeah, but, but I mean, thank you for I mean, you're so cold, you couldn't well, yeah, the these are, to holler. Exactly, yeah. and these are interesting yeah. stories to tell. So when the lifeboats, when people are in lifeboats out there, you could still, early on, for at least the first 20 or 30 minutes, there were people screaming, help me, help me. And hardly any of those lifeboats went back to help. Be, not because they were full necessarily, but a lot of times the people in the lifeboat said, no way are we going to go back because those people will swamp our boat and then we're all going to die. Yeah. So, tough choices, tough choices had to be made that night. Mm -hmm. So, some of the folks we're going to talk about tonight, the book will have all these people, but you will see, we've got first, second, third class passengers with ties to Iowa. We've got everyone from criminals to ministers so lots of variety so let's jump in i got to set the stage though just so you really understand how all this went down so titanic hits this iceberg on a sunday night april 14th 1912 at 11 40 p.m most people are in bed at this time a few are still cavorting around in some of the saloons and stuff some people are just getting ready to go to bed but Within two hours and 40 minutes, that ship is at the bottom of the ocean. Mm. And some people say, well, that shows how poorly built she actually was. But I say, no, it actually shows she was exceptionally well built because if you look at a ship like the Lusitania, which went down in 1915, not as big as Titanic, but somewhat similar, she sank in 20 minutes. Wow. 20 minutes. You can't save many lives in 20 minutes. That because we did have wireless and because they were able to get out some SOS calls, the word starts spreading almost immediately, Titanic's in trouble. But the, just like today, we have misinformation, fake All news. <laughs> this is the Des Moines Evening Tribune. So it's the late edition of the Monday, April 15th newspaper. Look at that headline. Monster liners passengers are all rescued. Wireless messages are once more effective in the saving of lives. Though badly damaged, the great steamer is still afloat, making her way towards Halifax under her own steam. So you can see even then, news was, it, it, let's be first rather than right. So, yeah. But I got some pop quizzes throughout this for you. Do you know what shocking Iowa event finally pushed Titanic, which would have been April 1912, what pushed that out of the headlines? You will know this. Oh. 1912 was a rough year. But this happened just a couple months after. 
Kathy? Yeah. The book? Yeah. She was that's in there. That's never been stopped. No, that, I've been obsessed with that since I was 12 years old and I first read about it. I, I wish we could solve that case, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> Let's talk about a kidnapper first. So, this guy right here, Michelle Navratil Sr. He was married to a beautiful lady named Marcel. They were French, but they were having marital problems, sadly. They were basically what we'd call separated. They had two young boys, and they were doing a split custody situation. There is an Iowa tie, so bear with me as we lead up to this. So they were, basically it was close to Easter when this ship went down, and it was one of those weekend visitation things where Michelle had his boys. He was supposed to return them to the mother, well, they just, he and the boys never came back. <laughs> what had happened, he bought tickets on Titanic, second class tickets. He takes an assumed name. He calls himself Lewis Hoffman. He gives the boys a, some very strange aliases, Lolo and Momon, but that's what they were. <laughs> and he had these two kids and he's passing himself off on Titanic as this poor widower who's taken his kids to America to start a new life. Remember, they're French, so they speak French. And like, uh, you know, some dads get a little stressed out sometimes with kids. He wanted a babysitter one night so he could have some fun, probably go play cards in the lounge. And he found, finds this lady at the dinner table who was sitting by him, a 17-year-old from Switzerland named Bertha Lehman. Bertha Lehman was headed to Central City, Iowa. Yeah. Central City is just over east of Cedar Rapids, so. That's Charles Maiden name, Layman. Layman. Is that right? <laughs> well, that you way. might be related then. <laughs> so even though she's Swiss, she spoke French. Um, this is one of those weird little things that, uh, you know, had she never encountered this character that's telling fibs on board, you know, who knows what would have happened, but she had been seasick most of the time and she didn't come out of her cabin till a few days into the journey and happens to meet this guy calling himself Lewis Hoffman. She said, sure, I'll babysit your kids. Well, then the Titanic hits the iceberg and the ship goes down. The father does not survive. There are the two little kids. They're adorable. <laughs> they did survive, obviously. And this picture, this is after the rescue ship Carpathia lands in New York and brings all these survivors back. Uh, I think it was the Associated Press or UPI, United Press International, took this picture and it went on all the wire services because newspapers could not get enough information about Titanic. This just goes viral. If, if you could go viral in 1912, these kids did. Wow. Guess who sees them? Oh, Their mother. <laughs> so now mother finally knows what happened to her kids. I mean, this woman's probably been in agony for days, wondering what, where are her kids in the first place, and then to find out they survived the Titanic is just incredible. She gets on the first ship to America and retrieves the kids, takes them back home. They both grew up and had good lives, and actually the youngest one, Michelle Navratil Jr., ends up being the long, one of the longest-lived male survivors of Titanic. So Bertha, who was headed to Iowa, did make it to Central City. She too survived. She gets married pretty fast from the time of the sinking. I don't know when in 1913, but you know, here uh, just a, a year or so later, she's already married to a guy named John Zimmerman. I know people got married younger in, back then, but sometimes I wonder if some of these life decisions some of these survivors made were driven by trauma. Because, you know, it, we, we have terms for these things and called post-traumatic stress disorder, and we have counselors. There was none of that in 1912. If you went through something traumatic, you were supposed to just shut up and keep your chin up and move on and forget about it. Well, life doesn't work that way. But regardless of what prompted this really fast marriage, she gets married, has a son named Elmer. Her, they start having marital problems pretty early on, sadly, but he ends up serving in World War I, he gets badly injured, ends up dying, and she remarries to a guy named Carl Lures, who's the gentleman over there. They go on to have a number of children, so Elmer and these other kids, they had a good life. They lived on farms in the Midwest and the Great Plains. She did go back a few times to Europe to visit family, and she ended up dying in 1967. 
Our, our grandma was a Zimmerman. I'm sure we're related. But there you go. <laughs> 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 now, that Tea Party in Iowa City, where I told you I had a boarding pass. Mm -hmm. There I am, I'm Frances Marie Le Faber. Oh, mm -hmm. I was 40 years old, I was from France, and I was accompanied by my four youngest children, traveling third class to Mystic, Iowa. Mystic. Anybody know where Mystic is? The big city of Mystic. It's down in southeast Iowa. If you know where Centerville is, roughly, it's a little town just down the road from Centerville. Well, you weren't having any fun if you had your four kids with you. Oh, no, that would not have been a whole lot of fun. <laughs> but this poor lady, if you thought that was bad, it gets worse. <laughs> because this was supposed to be a happy reunion. They were going to get reunited with her husband, Frank, who was working in coal mines. See, now, Appanoose County, which is where all this is happening, um, uh, Mystic and, and that whole area. 1912, the world runs on coal, right? We use it to heat homes and schools and power ships and everything else. And that was big coal mining country down there. It attracted a tremendous amount of immigrants to work in the coal mines down in that part of the world. So her husband Frank had been there for a while, as had their older son. They finally save up enough money to bring the rest of the family to France over here to Iowa. So it was supposed to be a happy reunion. Well, that reunion didn't happen, for one thing, because all five of these folks died. But had they made it, she would have had a very unpleasant surprise because Frank apparently couldn't wait around. He had a common law wife and missed it. Yeah, oh, there we go. Kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm not married. <laughs> He's in there for a while. Though. Yeah. So had he kept his mouth shut, he would have saved himself a lot of hassle. But what he did is he saw the picture I just showed you of the two little French boys, and he thought, eh, they could be my kids. So he starts raising a ruckus trying to sue the White Star Line for damages and such things. Well, then he gets on the radar of people he really didn't want to be on the radar. They found out he really wasn't here legally, he and his common law wife. And by the way, he kicked the common law wife out of his life at this point, too. And she was mad as a wet hen because he left her with no money. So he's, he's just got nothing problems. The last I could find is July of 1912. The Centerville newspaper said he and the, the uh, common law were being shipped back to France. And I don't know what happened to him after that. Now some people behaved much better on Titanic. We have the Caldwell family here. They were, well he, Albert, was originally from northwest Iowa from a town called Sanborn. Anybody ever heard of Sanborn up in northwest yeah. Iowa? Yeah. Yeah, so he was the son of a Presbyterian minister. In those days ministers moved around a lot. So born in Sanborn, but then ends up moving to Allerton, which is actually not that far away from Mystic in that whole part of the world. What's interesting about his story, he gets to go to college. And in the early 1900s, you got to remember, most people didn't even get past grade school. If you made it to eighth grade, that was a major milestone. It was unheard of, really, for most people, unless you were fairly wealthy, to go to college. And not only did he go to college, he met a girl who was in college. It was even less common for girls to get to go to college. They are at a place called Park College. It's still there today, still functioning. It's northwest of Kansas City, Missouri. So there is Albert. There's his young wife, Sylvia. They get married right out of college, and they take off for what was then known as Siam. Today we call it Thailand. They were mission church missionaries, and they taught English. They were having a blast. Young married couple, living a very adventurous life. They had great friends over there at this school. She gets pregnant with their first baby. There he is, a little guy named Alden. Now what happened is, I, nobody knows for sure, but she, Sylvia was not well after giving birth to this baby. And they finally decided, we can't handle this. Thailand is incredibly hot. Sylvia's health is failing. we got to get back home. So they go back to the States. And this picture here is, even though it's a crummy picture, they are on the deck of Titanic. <laughs> oh, really? And it's remarkable that, that that picture even exists because what happened is in those days, just think back years ago, I don't know if any of you remember this, it's before my time, but if you went to the airport, 
you can practically go right up to the plane door with people, you know, before, no, no way can you do that today, but it was loose back then, and they, they had a friend who was a photographer, he's just a camera buff, he gets to go on board before they take off from Southampton, England, after a very arduous journey to get them out of you know, ship after ship after ship, we'll talk about that in just a minute, but camera buff guy takes a picture of them on the deck of Titanic. Then he gets off because he's not sailing to America. That's the only reason this picture exists. That's amazing, isn't it? So we get out of Siam, it's, even now that would be a really long airplane ride, but in those days you had to take a lot of ships. It was just an arduous, arduous journey. She's ill on top of it. So by the time they make it to Naples, Italy, Great, let's just get a little R&R &R here, it's gonna be great. Well, there's a cholera outbreak. Oh, it's terrible when you've got an infant and compromised health yourself. Mm -hmm. This is when they first hear about Titanic. So their whole mission in life is to get a ticket on Titanic because if this is the biggest ship on earth and it's just so comfortable, it literally will be smooth sailing. We're not gonna be seasick. Life's gonna be a lot better. So your question about the tickets being sold out, that's what happens to them. They wanted a specific kind of ticket, but it was sold out. But they tell Albert at the ticket office, come back tomorrow, you never know. Someone might turn in a ticket and not be going. Well, that's what happened. And so here they thought, hallelujah, this is amazing. We're going on Titanic. So there's a whole book written about them by Albert's great niece. I've been in touch with her as I do my own research. That is a really good book, by the way, if you want to learn more about these folks. They call them a rare Titanic family simply because every one of these three people survived. Now this caused a lot of heartache later for Albert because when people would find out he was a Titanic survivor, they start putting the pieces together. Wait a minute, you're a guy, what'd you do? Push women and children out of lifeboats? What kind of a coward were you? So he'd always have to explain, it wasn't anything like that. I had a very sick wife, and she couldn't even hold our baby. So that's why I was able to go on the lifeboat. So they all survive. They do come back to Iowa. He ends up being a principal at Ames High from 1914 to 1917. Once again, you know, I don't know all the ins and outs of their relationship, but there was trauma here. They get divorced in 1930. But don't worry, Sylvia did fine. She remarried the president of State Farm Insurance Company. <laughs> <laughs> I know it. Albert, yeah, yeah, money can buy happiness, right? <laughs> so Albert remarried a very nice lady as well. Now these two folks, they were they were always very open about talking about the, their experiences on, on Titanic. Because you can imagine for decades after the sinking. Newspapers and media would come to these survivors for these anniversary, like five year, 10 year, 20 year anniversary of the sinking. What was it like that night? So those folks, those two were always very open and willing to talk. Some people were not. And in their family, the person who never wanted to talk about it was Alden. Because he said, look, I was just a baby when this yeah. happened. This did not define my life. I don't even remember it. I've done lots of important things with my life. I don't want to talk about that stupid old ship. <laughs> so he never liked to talk about it. Anybody know about orphan trains? I bet you do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So talking about someone who doesn't want to talk about their Titanic background would have been this Helen Delaney. Her details about, you know, this is a, I can't tell you a lot, it's very sketchy, her history and connection to Titanic, but apparently she was traveling with her parents. They did not survive. She's only four years old when the ship goes down. And she kind of gets chucked into a lifeboat, ends up in an orphanage in New York. And she gets put on an orphan train, sent out to the Midwest, makes it to Council Bluffs, and a nice family named the Delaney's adopt her. She grows up in Council Bluffs, never marries, works at a place called Kresge's, if any of you remember Kresge's. Yeah. Yeah. The forerunner of Kmart, which is no more. 
Uh, but she never talked about Titanic. So most people that knew this woman for decades had no idea that she had any connection to the Titanic. Yeah, but funny. late in life, she made an off-the-cuff remark to her doctor about it. So, so this is documented in a number of non parel excuse me, that's the um, Council Bluffs newspaper, the non parel so you will see some articles about it. But she died in 1982 and is buried in Council Bluffs. pretty cool. Do we have any Swedes in the room? Swedish heritage? A few. Excellent. We'll try not to hold that against you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a Swede here. And you know what? Iowa City Tea Party I keep talking about. The guest speaker that day was a lady who had, she is Swedish herself. And what she had done is translated lots of documents that were originally written in Swedish about people with ties to Titanic. And it's called Not My Time to Die. So I bought this book, and I start reading it, and I find out Dagmar Bryle, who was one of the ladies in the book, another Iowa tie. She was headed to America with her brother and fiance. They were headed to a place I'm sure you've heard of, Red Oak, Iowa. Oh, for <laughs> the So she's traveling second class, and I am forever grateful that this woman wrote this book, because I don't speak Swedish. I couldn't have translated these letters. I didn't even know they existed. So I'm going to share some of this, and I feel it's important to read it to you verbatim, because they're her words. She was there. I wasn't there. I want you to hear from someone who was there. So at this point, she's recovering in a hospital in New York City after being rescued. The family was going to stop in to visit this uncle. He was in Rockford, Illinois. They were going to make a stop there before heading to Red Oak, where they planned to settle. Dear uncle, the Titanic has gone down. I don't know whether my fiance and my brother Kurt are safe. Evidently, they are not, for most of the men went under. I'm at a hospital, but I'm not sick, although very feeble. I have lost everything. I have no clothes and so cannot get up, so must lie in bed for present. Mm -hmm. Now, she's not kidding when she says, I have nothing. You think about a lot of these third and second class travelers. If you're third class, there's a very good chance that your whole life was in your trunk, if you're immigrating and starting a new mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. Or if you escaped by the skin of your teeth, which a lot of them did that night, no matter what class you were in, you probably just had whatever you were wearing and maybe whatever was stuffed in your pockets. So she's, she really does have nothing. She speaks Swedish, which is another handicap in an English-speaking country. She's been incredibly traumatized because she's pretty sure her brother and her fiancé died. Not sure 100%, but pretty certain. Where do you go from here? I would have been glad if I'd been permitted to die because life no longer has any value for me since I lost my beloved. I feel myself so dreadfully alone in this land. These people are certainly good, but nevertheless do not understand me. So she talks about what it was like the night they hit that iceberg. Now one little weird trivia for you, from the time the lookouts spot that iceberg till the time of impact, 37 seconds. It was a very calm night, unusually calm. Any sailor that was paying attention that night said, wow, well, you just never get nights like this. And that was probably to their detriment. Had it been a little bit windy and had there been waves breaking against the icebergs, they're a whole lot easier to see than when it's calm. How, how, how would they have known it was only 30 some seconds? I mean, who's, somebody had survived was what, I mean. Yeah, so one of those guys, the, the Fred, I think it was Frederick Fleet was his name, and Reginald Denny, I believe, were the two young men up in the crow's oh, nest. so that's a, hmm. Yeah, so they would have been keeping time, keeping watch on all this. The other, good question though. The other weird thing is if they had actually hit that iceberg head on, it wouldn't have been good, but it would have been better. There would have been damage. There probably would have been loss of life. But the way it grazed the iceberg was the death knell for it, because it, it poked all these little pinholes, essentially, in the side that allowed all this water to shoot in. So she's in second class. Essentially, she's kind of in the middle of the ship, as best I could tell. If you're first class, you're way at the top. You may not have even felt that impact with the iceberg. It's possible you didn't. Second class, you knew something had happened, but you weren't sure what. Third class, down in the very lower levels of the ship, especially the closer you were to the impact site, you 
knew darn well something major had happened. So she's in that second class area. She noticed the jar. So sometimes people would feel something like, Ooh, and then the engine stopped, which tipped a lot of people off. Ooh, something bad has happened. Or sometimes you might have just noticed nothing more than your water glass shaking a little bit so when you're on these upper levels. So she, she felt something, and she hears her fiancé knocking at the door. Get up, Dagmar, he said. The ship has hit something. So she's smart. She, she throws on some warmer clothes. Not everybody did that either. But they hurry up to the deck. I don't know how many decks they had to climb, but the officer said, go back. There's no danger. Go to your cabins. Now, depending on when this happened, you, you could condemn the officer and say, my God, man, what do you say? There's no danger. <laughs> but early on, no one, including the, the people, the, the crew on the ship, were not quite clear just how bad this was. Remember, this is a massive ship. The crew has never worked on this ship before. It's their maiden voyage. You've got no PA systems or anything like that. It's just rather chaotic. And the last thing we need is for people, passengers, getting the idea that this ship's going down and then we're going to have a mutiny. So they're trying to keep people calm. So she goes back to her berth. They go back to bed. So then there's more knocking on that door. Get up, Dagmar. We are in danger, Ingvar yelled. I don't care what the ship's officers say. This boat is sinking. That was a very smart move because I have done a little research into the history of disasters and how you, you survive them. Listen to your gut. <laughs> yeah. Because sometimes even when people mean well, they're just telling you the wrong thing. Follow your gut. So she gets dressed again. She runs upstairs as far as they can with the, this fiancé and her brother. And she talks about hearing awful screaming and yelling. Now at this point, this tells me this is pretty close to the end. Because for the quite a while, at least the first hour or more, after impact, no one is screaming and yelling, no one's carrying on. It's kind of treated like a joke, actually, when the crew starts telling people get in the lifeboats. Because you've got to remember, it's after midnight at this point. It's very, it's dark, it's bright, but it's dark. There's, there's stars in the sky, but it's very dark, it's very cold. And after you've been on the floating palace that has electric heat, and lights, and a nice warm bed, and you're on a practically unsinkable ship. How many of you would like to go out in the cold and get in this little teeny lifeboat compared to this huge ship? And because we haven't sunk that much, remember that 11 stories tall business? You got a long ways to go down in the dark to reach the ocean surface. I'm not sure I would have wanted to get in a lifeboat. And some people, just like in the movie, they're kicking chunks of ice around like a hockey puck. It's kind of a joke. And, oh, yeah, honey, get in the boat. We'll see you at breakfast tomorrow. Just be a good girl, you know. So at this point, though, everyone's real crystal clear. This ship is going down. And, so they all, and because of the screaming and yelling also tells me that they knew not only is she going down, not everybody's getting in a lifeboat. So she gets in a lifeboat. and. She's freaking out at this point because she's realizing that the brother and the fiance are not getting in this lifeboat. You know, come with me, come with me, she's screaming. And that was not to be. Now, plenty of life belts, all these life jackets, they call them life belts. So everybody had their life belt on. Basically, those are pieces of cork with canvas sewn over them. Oh dear. Yeah. So, you know, if you want to know the brutal reality, this really didn't save too many people. What it did, it might keep you floating in that water, only to die of hypothermia. Or worse, depending if you had to jump or make some other drastic escape, depending on how far you're falling, that thing will break your neck when you hit the water. Or roll apart. heart. Yeah. Because it's so weird. You would think falling into water, even from a height, would it would be a nice fall but it's not it's like after you get over a certain height it's like falling on concrete yeah. mm. so so that's just a nasty reality <laughs> <laughs> so there is an actual picture of survivors in one of the collapsible lifeboats there were 16 wooden ones and then there were four of these they're called Engelhart collapsible canvas boats so these the ship goes down at 2:20 a.m. it breaks in half the two parts sink 
And sometimes you'll read accounts from survivors where some of them said, oh yeah, I saw it break in two, and others say, no, it didn't. But remember, it all depends on where you were at that night. You might not have been able to see it clearly that it did break in two. So it wasn't until Ballard discovered that ship in 85 that we could conclusively say, yes, she did break in half that night. So you're out there in these lifeboats, if you made it in a lifeboat, 2.20 a.m., the ship is gone, the Carpathia won't get there till about 4 a.m. The Carpathia was 58 miles away, I believe. So that's the rescue ship that picked up the, the, the call for help. They, it, it's crazy too, when you think about this, they had to turn around, put on full steam ahead, and go through the same ice field that sank the Titanic. It's amazing they didn't sink too. <laughs> so, excuse me, so yeah. this picture got taken. That was Needless taken. Needless to say, when somebody was picking them up and they just decided yep. to take a picture, it, which that, is weird. That is the morning yeah. of May, April 15th. That is from the deck of the Carpathia with a passenger that had a camera. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, in, and even a, a water rescue like that, there's nothing easy about any of this. So, when the, first of all, when, before the Carpathia comes mm -hmm. and you're out there in the middle of the night, even if you're in a lifeboat, I'm sure most of these people thought they were still going to die because. Mm -hmm that when Titanic starts to sink, is it going to cause massive suction that pulls you down with it? Mm -hmm. yeah. It didn't, but who knew, right? Yeah. And then you also don't know if the wireless operators got that SOS out in time. Did anybody hear it? Does anybody know we're out here? <laughs> or are we just going to end up dying in these god-awful little lifeboats? But the Carpathia did come to the rescue. And so about as dawn is breaking, they start getting there, 4 or 5 a.m., they're loading passengers. They're all done loading survivors by about 8 or 8.30 that morning. But you think about this, this huge ship, not as big as Titanic, but a big cruise ship coming alongside these little lifeboats. How do you get out of a little lifeboat mm -hmm. into a big ship? Well, if you're strong enough, you climb a rope ladder. Mm -hmm. If you're not weak, or if you are weak, or have a baby or something, they have these things called bosun chairs, which are like a canvas sling. <laughs> they put you in that and haul you up, basically. And then you got to remember, the Carpathia had a full load of passengers headed to the Mediterranean. So then you've got all these 700-some <coughs> extra people. So you just have to put them on the deck and, and put them in the dining rooms and wherever you can. It's, it's really crazy. So she ends up being rescued, and she's just hysterical. She said, I never would have let those guys put me in the lifeboat if I knew they weren't going to survive. And she just said, enough, you know, I, I can't, the red oak is off. So she ends up going back to Sweden. She does get married to a guy named Eric Holmberg. She dies in 1969. Now speaking of red oak, just down the road here, at Stanton, Iowa, probably heard of Stan, probably been there. <laughs> this is another Swedish um, heritage story, although Ernest Danbaum, he was a first generation American, but he was a Montgomery County farmer. Young guy, you know, he's got a new wife, and he and his wife Anna were headed back to the old country for a, uh, basically a family reunion and a honeymoon after they get married in 1910. And Sometimes we think people never, once they went somewhere, like a big trip, they, they maybe stayed a little while, or maybe, you know, like if you went back from America to Europe, it was just a quick trip. No, none of this. They, they sometimes stayed a long time. Look at this. This was almost two years that he spent over there after traveling from Iowa back to the home country. And how they had that much money, though. I, mean, I know. It is, I it is interesting. So they, they, they were there long enough. Their first baby was born there. <laughs> a little guy named Gilbert. She's got him on her lap. <laughs> Ernest had a little side hustle. It was, it was legit, but he would try and round up people that wanted to go to America and sell them on going on a certain shipping line, and they'd basically give him a little kickback, a little reward for getting them <laughs> on their ship line. So he's got a good deal going. He ends up getting about a dozen friends from Sweden, he's a Sweden, that wanted to go to America. One lady we won't talk about, but she'll have her own chapter in the book, is Anna Nyston. She was in this group out of this whole bunch. Sadly, she's the only one that survived. They're traveling third class. 
That would have been a third class cabin, very typical accommodations. It's nothing to write home about by today's standards, but in 1912, this was pretty luxurious for, for third class. Where's the mattress? <laughs> yeah, right? I know, and it was probably stuffed with, who knows, horse hair or straw, I don't know. But this is still a lot better than what travel would have been on other ships, and certainly better than what it would have been 10 or 20 years prior to this. Because for one thing, you had food service. You didn't have food service in some of these other ships in previous years. You had to bring your own. And you had running water. And fear not, ladies, there was one bathtub for 700 women in third class. <laughs> <laughs> and there was one bathtub for 700 men. Oh, for gosh. Uh -huh. You think about it, most people did not have indoor plumbing at this time. So even something that sounds pretty crude by our standards would have oh been pretty luxurious. So, I was just actually, Mom and I were just actually going through Stanton the other day, and I stopped to pay my respects. We both did. There's his tombstone in the, the old cemetery in Stanton. This is one of the, sadly, the victims of, of Titanic, one of our Iowa people, that actually makes a note of that on the, the tombstone. A lot of the other ones, you'd have no clue if you just looked at their tombstone. They had any tie to Titanic. But his says it right on the stone that his remains were recovered from the ocean, near my God to thee, with that reference to that Christian hymn. Now, this is interesting too. How did we know that was Ernest Danbaum's body when they recovered it? We don't have driver's licenses in 1912. We don't have social security cards. How on earth do you know who he is? <coughs> he had stuff in his pockets, paperwork and whatnot that gave it away. And you can also kind of put the clues together by how someone is dressed. He probably was not dressed like a first class passenger, being that he was third class. He probably wasn't wearing a tuxedo or had gold cufflinks. So then you can whittle it down. He's probably third class. And then there was some of the paperwork. He had quite a bit of money on him, too, because his goal was to move his family to Turlock, California and start a fruit farm. Well, that didn't happen. But sadly, they never did recover the bodies of his wife or his baby. Excuse me, they wouldn't have had like fingerprint uh, back in the day. I mean, they wouldn't no, have No, fingerprinting about that. would have just been really, really new technology yeah. and only used in criminology, if then, even. So, so yeah, it, that's why so many of those bodies are were never identified. So, if you go to Halifax, where a lot of those folks, the, the bodies that were recovered, they only recovered about 300 some bodies. But the ones that did not have a family that could ship them home, or we never identified who the body was, they are buried in just row after row of numbered graves. Wow. 134, 135, 136. So one of the last passengers I want to introduce you to tonight is a gentleman named Walter Douglas. So he and his wife, Mahela, were traveling first class. They're both Cedar Rapids natives. Anybody been to Bruce Moore, the big mansion mm -hmm. in Cedar Rapids? Okay, yes, this is the Douglas family home. So this is where Walter's family would have resided. They were wealthy people, wealthy business people in Cedar Rapids. To this day, Cedar Rapids is still a grain milling town, right? So these folks made their money grinding corn into cornstarch at the Douglas Starch Works. He made plenty of money. He retired by the time he was 50. And he was um, on this extended trip that spring of 1912, winter into spring of 1912, with his wife to buy cool stuff on the grand tour of Europe to fa furnish their fabulous lake home up at Lake Minnetonka. Anybody been to that Lake Minnetonka area? Yes, southwest of the Twin Cities. Beautiful. Beautiful. And you got to have a lot of money to live up there to this day. <laughs> it's kind of like Okaboji on steroids. <laughs> so they had built a wonderful home called Deep Haven. It still stands up there. You can take tours around the lake up there. And, and it's cool. It's fun to go up there. Uh, but they uh, last time they'd been back in Cedar Rapids was Christmas of 1911 to see the family. They went on this grand tour. Uh, Mahela was quite a lady in and of her own right, that once again this is a case of a second marriage for these folks. Mahela was kind of the talk of Cedar Rapids because she smoked, for one thing, which was quite shocking for a lady in 1912. Uh, but they're coming back on Titanic, getting ready to celebrate Walter's birthday when they get home. Life is awesome. 
this is kind of gives you a sense of a first class. Now, I'm not saying their first class cabin and parlor was this elaborate. This is probably top of the line. But that's just the parlor for one of these first class suites. Did you think that fireplace actually worked? It was probably just decorative because they would have had electric heat. Yeah. And what's interesting, like some of that decor, the clock, for example, would have been bolted to the mantle because it's a ship. Yeah, you don't want things flying off. So uh, some of these pictures I took when I was at a Titanic exhibit at the National Geographic Museum in Washington, D.C. They, they did a good job of giving you a flavor for what life was like on board. First class passengers would have been wearing all kinds of beautiful clothing. This is where probably Mahala would have maybe even had a Lady Duff Gordon outfit. And she definitely needed help with all her fashions because she had something like a dozen trunks of clothes. So of course she took her maid with her. Uh, it was a, a gal named Bertha Leroy. She was a French maid. She traveled in, she went was in first class just in a little cabin right next to their cabin. Yes. I'm just thinking, you're, I, yeah. I'm surprised though that even if you're in first class, class that you could take, you would think there'd be like a plate you can only take this Right? Huh. Not for these people, apparently. Wow. It's it's shocking how much well, gear how much some weight, of, you know, all that I know, would, right? Take yeah, this was like a 46,000 ton ship. They had cars on board. They had a Renault oh, car on board and everything. So apparently, maybe it helped because they weren't at capacity with passengers. Nobody ever, I've never read that people couldn't take all their stuff. But, but you're right, on an airplane, this would be a major problem. <laughs> so trunk after trunk of clothes. And when you're traveling first class, let's be real, one of the fun things of being on a ship like that is to see and be seen. So you wear different outfits at breakfast and morning tea and supper and all this stuff. And you have a maid to help you get dressed. It's really great. So... The night that all this happens, the last night on board Titanic, they were with some of their first class friends at a fancy dinner party on board, the kind where you wear ball gowns and tuxedos. When all hell starts breaking loose, Mahala, being that she's a woman and she's a first class passenger, has a real good shot at getting a lifeboat. But she's just like our friend Dagmar. She wants her husband to come with her. He refused. He said, no, I must be a gentleman. And the last he was seen was helping other people get into lifeboats, which was very good. But he did not survive. Now, in those days, how do you get, how would your family know what's going on? Because I showed you that newspaper where there's all this misinformation around. And you would hang out at the telegraph office because that's who's going to hear it first, the list of survivors and victims. So the family, because the, the, unlike our kidnapper friend, who no one knew where he was, <laughs> the Douglas family knew darn well that Walter and Mahala were on this ship, and they're desperate for news of did they survive. So they go to the newspaper office, the Cedar Rapids Republican, and that's when they got word over the telegraph <coughs> that she had made it and Walter did not. She was quite an artist and a poet and a patron of the arts. She's a widow now, of course, but she goes back to Lake Minnetonka, lives out the rest of her days there. She was never to be remarried. Um, there's a picture, you can see her French maid who also survived. She's the tall lady in that lower right-hand picture. That's Bertha Leroy. Um, that's Mahala, different phases of her life. But at some point she writes this poem about being on Titanic. The sea, velvet smooth, blue-black. The sky set thick with stars, unbelievably brilliant. The horizon, a clean-cut circle. The air motionless, cold, cold as death. Boundless space. A small boat waiting, waiting in this vast stillness, waiting heartbreakingly. In the offing, a vast ship, light streaming from her portholes. Her prow on an incline. Darkness comes to her suddenly. The black hulk stands, stands out in silhouette against the starlit sky. Silently, the prow sinks deeper, as if some titan's hand, inexorable as fate, were drawing the great ship down to her death. Slowly, slowly, with hardly a ripple of that velvet sea, she sinks out of sight. Then a vast, the vast emptiness was suddenly rent with a terrifying sound. It rose like a column of heavy smoke. It was so strong, so imploring, so insistent, one thought it would even reach the throne of grace on high. But slowly it lost its force, thin to a tiny wisp of sound. 
then to a pitiful whisper, silence. And here we are, all these years later, still talking about this ship, which is really kind of strange, because this happened a long time ago. This certainly wasn't the worst shipwreck in history. Didn't even come close to the worst loss of life. But we just can't let this story go, can we? Now, we did let it go for a while. It, it made headlines everywhere, but then in short order, guess what? World War I breaks out in 1914. Then comes the Great Depression. Then comes World War II. Talk about massive loss of life, right? No one is paying much attention or cares what happened to Titanic. But everything changes in 1955 because there's a guy named Walter Lord who remembers the days of those great transatlantic liners. He traveled on one as a kid in the 20s. And he got to thinking, you know what? There's still a fair number of Titanic survivors left. I wonder if they talk to me. <laughs> so he reached out to people like the Caldwells, and they did talk to him. And he publishes this book called A Night to Remember, and it set the world on fire. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, Titanic mania is alive and well again. And then whoever mentioned Molly Brown, then in 1960 comes the musical The Unsinkable Molly Brown, even though she never called herself Molly, she was Martin. But then the musical such a hit, Hollywood, goes on the coattails of this and has the film version in 1964. I don't know, oh, it's Titanic, the one we probably are more familiar with. That film came out in 97. There, last I knew, there was a Titanic 2 that a, an Australian businessman is going to make an exact replica of Titanic. It's being built in China. <laughs> um, it was supposed to sail a few years ago. I don't know where this project stands, but how many of you would love to go on Titanic 2? <laughs> Most adults say no, but if I have kids in the room, they're all like, yeah! As long as it doesn't sail and see, I'll go on. There you go. I mean, it could happen the second time. Yeah, I know. Lightning can't strike twice, right? Yeah. So, the Carpathian, where did they take the, where did they go to? I picked up the survivors for the Carpathia sail too. Okay, so the Carpathia rescue ship goes directly to New York City. Okay. Good question. And then they they get more supplies and whatnot, and they take off again to their original destination of the Mediterranean. In my book, you will meet a guy who was on that ship, the Carpathia. He was a newspaper man originally from Iowa. He becomes the first newspaper man to break that whole story because he was on the rescue ship and he and his wife started interviewing people. Wow. It's quite a story. Huh. Yes. Um, looked it up. It just got finished and it set sails this year. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. What, where was it heading, did it say? It doesn't have voyage edge. It's just oh, setting sail. That would be kind of normal. How many people of color were on the ship? There were some. There was a black gentleman from Haiti. I cannot remember his name, actually, but he was one of the few. But there were also people from China and elsewhere. So it was incredibly diverse on this ship. And actually, that was part of the challenge when this sunk, too, because you've got people from all over the world speaking all different kinds of languages. How do you, I mean, they don't have, and this was just had to be chaos. I, I feel for those people, especially the ones from China and elsewhere. How, it's a language barrier. How do you even know where to go? Yeah. You were talking about that chef that drank a lot and he survived. Mm -hmm. And then you showed a picture of the book, A Night to Remember. Mm -hmm. He is featured in a chapter in Walter Lord's book, A Night to Remember. Yeah. Check it out. I mean, his story sounds so implausible, mm -hmm. but it's true. And I guess <laughs> he fought in World War II, the huh. chef. Yeah, I mean he lived. Quite he lived long. a long time. Yeah, so he didn't have, amazingly didn't suffer a lot of ill effects from it. So drink a lot of booze if you're. He <laughs> probably still does because of the. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know the, the book that he wrote, the night to remember. They made a movie mm -hmm. of that too in the fifties and that. I want to say yeah. Barbara Stanwyck. I want to say you're correct. You're that, correct. that really ignited my interest in it, but I do remember seeing that as a Yes, you're, you're right. There yeah. was a Titanic movie, and I think it was around 57 I'm or something say, yeah, like that. I would say, yes, somewhere in there, yeah. Are, and you can still buy that. I got a copy Everyone's that I got on Amazon. It's, it's on Turner Classic, too. Uh, yeah. yeah. Once in a while. Yeah. So you're right. See, about every 10 yeah. years, there's something major that 
that causes a whole new generation of titanium, which they call them. Yeah. Your fans is your titanium. So there aren't that many places really where you can see this kind of stuff, but one of them is down at Branson. Anybody been there? Not to, well, the Branson or the Branson Museum. So they have some of the. They have actual they artifacts. Have, yeah. And you know what? I held it. So the museum is actually that. It looks like the ship. Oh, that is the museum. Mm -hmm. But I didn't go there for the longest time because I thought, okay, Branson, you know, that's, that's music. That's entertainment. This can't be a serious museum. It is, though. Mm -hmm. It's very, very good. So definitely go. And there's a sister museum to it in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. That's right. They could put dollars. Yeah, Dollywood. <laughs> so I've thought a lot about this. Why do we still care about this story? I think simply because it's got everything that is that, gra that captures the imagination with a human story. You've got heroes, you've got cowards, you've got criminals, you've got everything going on. And I think we all think, what would I have done that night if I'd been one of them? I can't. A lot of friend. <laughs> well, that too. Um, Let's see, we can run some numbers and just the cold hard facts will give you some clues of what might have happened to you. So roughly 713 people make it to New York. Sometimes these numbers are a little sketchy because the record keeping is a little Out loosey Out of what again? 2,000, 3,000? Roughly 2,200. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So ladies, you had a great shot. You had about a three and four chance of making it. <laughs> oh. Kids, eh, not so good, about half, you know, 50-50. Men, good luck, you got a one in five chance. I'm sorry. Uh, first class passengers, you've got a real good chance here. Second class, once again, about 50-50. Third class, not good. About 75% of them died. And that is simply a fact that they were way down in the bottom of the ship. This is a very big ship. It just would have been really hard to get to those upper decks in time, frankly. There's the grand staircase. Like um, the when movie. Cameron made that movie in 87 or 97, what it took to make that sinking scene here look realistic, they used so much water it actually destroyed the movie set. <laughs> but I want you to notice that beautiful floor. You see the white, the black and white, very pretty. What do you think that's made out of? Marble. On Titan. Marble, linoleum, or tile? Which one? Do you think? Marble? Marble. Marble. Tile. Linoleum. Oh, I have to be real grand. It's no. linoleum. Oh, really? Yeah. Hey. I thought really if that was that special. I know. Isn't, isn't that crazy? Uh, so well, that linoleum. had to just bubble up and... Probably once it's sunk. Yeah. But yeah, it, well, see, linoleum was actually invented in the late 1860s. I didn't realize it was that old. Uh, but on a ship, weight counts. So this is a way they could keep the... You know, these other two things, marble and tile, those are heavy. The other thing is the designers love linoleum because you can make it any color, any pattern. So even though this is a world-class floating palace, it had a surprising amount of linoleum on board. <laughs> but you wonder, though, how long that water would be sitting before that would start bubbling up, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, it probably has not fared too well. Well, no, I'm just thinking. <laughs> when, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, the other thing is that there are little microbes as we speak that love to eat iron, and they're, they're eating titanic as we speak. So oh. eventually, we don't know how fast this will happen, but titanic will not exist anymore. It will eventually turn into a pile of rust. Mm -hmm. Yes? Oh. So, I love archaeology, especially underwater archaeology. Yeah. Um, and as you said, yes, the amoebas are eating at, away at the metal. Mm -hmm. Some of the wood, however, is going a little bit slower, mm -hmm. which I think is cool, because you think that wood would be the first to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and what's amazing is the leather, like leather bags, leather shoes, they're holding up just fine. Of course, the porcelain dishes and all that, they're, they're immune to those microbes, but in some of those leather bags and whatnot, they have found letters and paper items that are still legible. Really? Because the leather think that would all be all from the water? You would think, but apparently that bag must have been watertight enough and it almost creates this anaerobic environment in there. Mm. It's amazing. Wow. The other interesting wow. thing is there was a perfumer on board from England and he had a leather case. It was kind of like a display case of all these vials of his different perfumes. He was going to start a new company in, in America. Well, back probably 20 years ago, some of these uh, people that salvaged this stuff, they found his bag and they opened up those vials. You can still smell the perfume. And yes. so around the 100th anniversary of the sinking in well, it'd be 2012, 
QVC had a whole line of perfume called Titanic 1912. Nope. You can still find it sometimes on eBay. <laughs> I have a bottle or two of it. It's, it's actually not that pricey. And if you like old time kind of rose scents, like maybe your grandma might have had, it's actually a really nice scent. So if you ever get Titanic 1912, I recommend it. <laughs> yeah, it, it's amazing. So one of these museums, I think this one, this quote, actually I saw at the Luxor Hotel. That, another weird thing, the Luxor, the Pyramid Hotel out in Vegas, they've got an amazing Titanic exhibit. So go there too. Yeah, crazy, huh? And so on the wall, after you find out with your boarding pass, if you lived or if you died, sometimes people will ask this question, why do you keep talking about dead people and the shipwreck and all this really sad stuff? Well, because it's captivating, and honestly, the best way to honor this history is to share their stories and tell their tales. And that's what we did tonight. There's the cover of my book, someday when I get the book actually written. Uh, but you know all these people. Mahela, and there's the Caldwells, and there is the Dan Bombs. And actually, that clip art on the back there of Titanic, that's not random clip art. That was taken from a postcard that was sent to Cedar Rapids in 1912. Oh, wow. So cool. when before we get this in the library? Well, uh, <laughs> if I had been on the ball and gotten my book done, see, your fine librarian was ready to buy it on Amazon. So I truly want to get this done this year. I've been working on it for quite a while. And then we'd have to be on the waiting list because everybody's going to grab it. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Well, how long is it? I mean, <clears throat> most of my books come in at around 200 okay. some pages. So, cool. yeah, and there will be about. Just like the stories you heard tonight, there will be about that many more stories that you didn't hear tonight. So you'll get a lot of pictures, pictures in there. Yes, oh, and it isn't quite as tour or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but I do have all my other books here tonight. You're welcome to take a look. They're, most of them are twenty-four to twenty-eight dollars. I'm happy to sign them if you're looking for gifts or anything like that. I'm online. Follow me. Let's stay connected. And can I answer any more questions anybody might have? I, yes. just, I was wondering, you know, you heard some of the things about um, there were gates that were that didn't allow the third class passengers up to the higher right. decks in order to get. Was that true or is that just movie making? That was true, but it was not to stymie them when they when the ship is sinking. Like I mentioned earlier, when that whole thing of Jack and Rose, the first class lady falling in love oh, with the yeah. third class well, guy, never would have happened because they were yeah. in these distinct areas of the ship and they did have gates simply so that third class could not come into some of those other places. But part of that too was to prevent any disease spread. No. Because, you know, it sounds a little harsh by modern ears, but that was, a, you know, healthcare was not what it was to, in 1912, not like it is today. So you don't want to be spreading communicable diseases, and sadly, your third class passengers probably would have had more challenges with that than your first class. So if they had the today, how many would have had COVID? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But, but yeah, the, sometimes that gets misconstrued that they were locked out on purpose. No, it was just in the chaos of the moment, there were just things like that that happened, that the gate was locked. It was not to keep them from getting to the lifeboats. It's just a sad fact that happened. All you need to do is try to break into somebody's room and, uh, and uh, get their tuxedo or something, and then you can... Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Eat the fancy food. If you could find your way. You know, it, it must have been really quite... You think, it, has anybody been on a really big cruise ship today? Yeah. They're not that, you know, if, if all hell breaks loose and you've only been on this ship for a few days, it's confusing. It's confusing, <laughs> isn't it? Discovered mm -hmm. Yeah, now granted, compared to what, like a big carnival ship, a, a Titanic was this big, these big ships, you know, they're like this big, but still, that's, there's a lot of ground to cover and you just might not be able to find your way in time. I, I got yeah. to think of at the beginning, I thought, Oh my gosh, if you were seasick and were on there, you know, on a, that sh on a ship, oh my gosh, I'd been miserable. It would, it would because I, I don't know, I suppose in those days maybe they don't travel with the doctor, I think, like they do now. And they did get, have doctors oh, okay. on board. Okay. Usually those ships had at least one okay. or two doctors. I didn't know back in the day. Sure. But I don't know you what know, they would have gained on that compared to. Right, and I don't know what the fee structure would have been, like if, if it cost extra, if you were in third class, would you have just skipped seeing the doctor? I don't know for sure. Oh, 
Yeah. Who would even see a doctor? Probably not. Yeah. Because mine came over, mine all came from Denmark and they came before Ellis Island mm -hmm. in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. And they were all, they were just off the ship. Yeah. 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 And my great grandparents had had a child. In fact, my great grandmother had waited to come until the child was born. Mm -hmm. And we know that the child was born in the mother. Right. The child never survived the trip. Wow. So that could have been, if the child didn't survive that ocean crossing. Bar, and they had the listing of the people that. Wow. So that could have been a burial at sea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't catch that. Why would he have seen it? We don't know what happened, I guess. All we yeah. know is that I, I, your ancestor boarded this ship with the baby. Yeah, the baby is listed on when they're boarding. The baby is listed on the boarding, but not the, 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 when they disembark. So we don't know what happened, but if the child didn't survive, there's a very real possibility they would have had to do a burial at sea. Really? Yeah, that wasn't yeah. that uncommon. No, it wasn't. Yeah. There was a lot of the same name. Yeah. Well, you know, talking about mortality, oh, just one more little trivia thing for you. How? What do you think the average lifespan of an American was in 1912? Let's let's say a less than 40. 60, 30 something maybe. Good guesses. So it's roughly give or take around 50. Over. Mm -hmm. It was a whole different world, folks. Yeah. Oh yeah. You've been a very we have wonderful a way, audience. Way easy. Yeah, we have it easy, don't we? Yeah. Thank you for all the great questions. It's really been fun. For me. I was just being funny. It's not whoever I said that. Yes. Right before we all get up, I just want to thank Darcy Malsby for coming and presenting here. And one last thanks to um, Humanities Iowa and the State Historical Society for helping us put on this program. And she has books over there for sale. <laughs> oh, you know, I don't have a sign-up sheet, but if you want to be on my list for when the my book yeah. comes out, come see me. I'll I'll rustle up some paper. We'll, we'll make a list here. Email the Harlan Library so you know when it's coming. That might be the easiest, right? I will do that. that I like and they're giving me more work. They're giving me more work. Thanks, folks. Appreciate it. Right? Probably.